Okay, uh, in this particular video we are going to talk about gas transport and how it essentially relates to the respiratory system. I strongly recommend if you haven't studied the concept of um, partial pressure and uh, basically how systemic uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide changes uh, occur throughout the um, cardiovascular system and uh, just learn about the basic concepts of respiration. I would strongly recommend stopping here and whether it's my video, someone else's video, or you read about it in your book, I really wouldn't recommend going a whole lot further without kind of walking in with that knowledge first. Um, obviously, if you've already studied it or you're just here to review, awesome. But it's just kind of a, a, a recommendation. So, um, all right, so the topics we'll cover is uh, we'll have a basic review on hemoglobin, not too crazy in depth because, like I said, if you've gone through, wait, wait, not if, if you're on the respiratory system, you've already gone through the cardiovascular system and should have a good, at least basic working knowledge of hemoglobin. Um, so basically what we'll essentially talk about are factors that affect um, oxygen unloading and loading, uh, carbon dioxide loading and, uh, loading and unloading, um, Excuse me. So that's essentially what we're going to cover. And then the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. That's a mouthful. Um, with it, that'll just be kind of a more of a visual representation of how this process works and factors that affect loading and unloading, primarily of, uh, of uh, oxygen. Okay. Uh, so first, let's talk about um, oxygen and how we circulate it around. Uh, oops, before we do that, however, let's talk about a couple of factors that's associated with gases. My apologies. Um, so basically, the first thing we have to think about is the solubility of gases and essentially how they behave uh, when dissolved in uh, water. Now remember that oxygen is a very, very poorly soluble gas in water. When we say that, what we're saying is it does not mix in water very well. So as a result, it's a little more tricky to transport um, throughout, the, throughout the cardiovascular system. Whereas carbon dioxide, it's a lot more easily dissolved. So there's a handful of different ways we can move it around the body. All right, because remember, you have to remember when you're thinking about blood, I mean, that what we're essentially talking about is how are we transporting these gases throughout blood to specific areas of the body. Remember that blood by composition is 55% plasma. Okay, and that's basically like saying 55% of your blood is water, right? You know that there's proteins and there's stuff mixed in there, but um, but that's something you have to keep in mind. So that so and that's where the concept of hemoglobin comes in. Uh, because it's a lot easier to grab onto hemoglobin versus just trying to, uh, you know, try try to dissolve it in water because uh, it, it, there's just not enough in the air to, and there's not a great enough partial pressure for us to actually do that. So, so hemoglobin actually is our way of getting around that 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 uh, poor ability of oxygen to dissolve in fluid and transport it around. I don't know many different ways I can say that, but. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Whereas carbon dioxide, I'll talk more specifically in a second, carbon dioxide is, there's a, there's a handful of different ways we can move it around just because it mixes in water a lot more easily. Now one thing to think about though when we're talking about hemoglobin is that both oxygen and carbon dioxide can bind to hemoglobin, okay? Both CO2 and O2 bind to hemoglobin. However, they do not compete, okay? So they do not compete. Okay. Oxygen and CO2 do not compete for, for hemoglobin. All right. So remember, let, let's just talk about hemoglobin and what it is for a second. Hemoglobin is a quaternary protein, all right, made up of two alpha, two beta chains. All right. Remember, so basically just you've got the same. When we say a quaternary protein, we're just saying four tertiary proteins kind of globbed together. Um, you know, highly specifically glob. It's not as a, you know, I don't want to try to underplay the complexity of this protein, but you get the picture. Um, and then centrally located in each protein molecule is a heme group, right? And that's essentially what you're looking at here in these images here. This is heme, all right? And in the center, the key part of this heme group the is the central portion of heme, and that is iron, 
okay, iron. Now the reason why you need to focus on that is because the iron in the heme, in the heme group, that is what oxygen actually sticks to, okay? So oxygen sticks to the center, to the iron that's centrally located within, the, within each hemoglobin protein. And each iron, in e basically each, each hemoglobin protein uh, can stick one oxygen molecule to it. So essentially one, one total hemoglobin molecule can grab onto four oxygen molecules, can grab onto four oxygens, okay? Can grab onto four oxygens. So let's think about that for a second. If our, if we only had, um, if we only had two oxygens stuck to each hemoglobin molecule in the human body, what would our what would our saturation be? What would our what would our oxygen saturation be? Well, it would be right at it would be at fifty percent or a hair less. All right, it would be right around fifty percent. So the basically what we're saying here is that when oxygen combines uh, to hemoglobin, there's a certain amount of oxygen that combines the hemoglobin in our blood, and that's essentially what we're referring to as our O2 saturation. Okay, our O2 saturation. And under normal conditions, our blood is about 98, 97, depending on what book you read or who you ask. Um, blood is right around 98% saturated with oxygen. It's never going to be 100% just because there's in the heart, there's a little bit of, of mixing between deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. So another way to say that then is that 90% of our hemoglobin is in the form of oxyhemoglobin. Okay, 98% of our blood is in the form of oxyhemoglobin. So basically what I'm saying is, is when, when, when an oxygen combines with hemoglobin, when, it, when a hemoglobin molecule actually has oxygen attached to it, we refer to it as oxyhemoglobin, okay? And when, and so basically the remaining, so the remaining 2% of hemoglobin is in the form of deoxyhemoglobin. I'm just gonna write deoxy, I'm just gonna abbreviate that. So deoxy, lack of oxygen, all right? So 98, so basically our blood is 98% saturated with oxygen. And so basically we, so 98% of the oxygen we circulate around in the blood is, in the, is, is, is bound to hemoglobin. And the remaining, you know, 2% or a little under uh, 2% is just going to be freely in the plasma. And it's going to be, it's just going to circulate in the plasma. But how, but, um, all right, but remember, we use hemoglobin to get over oxygen's poor affinity and solubility to water. All right, and that's essentially how we transport it around. Now, one thing to remember if we go back to the previous slide when I was talking about carbon dioxide and hemoglobin, I said that carbon dioxide and hemoglobin, or I'm sorry, carbon dioxide and oxygen do not compete with one another. So what I'm saying is that carbon is that oxygen binds to the iron in hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide just binds elsewhere. Okay, carbon dioxide just binds elsewhere. It, it interacts with the hemoglobin molecule outside of that heme group, um, you know, or basically in, in a different part of that in that hemoglobin molecule. So these two don't they don't fight one another for for binding essentially. Okay, now that's a nice thing because, well, I mean, think about that. If we had these two fighting for each other, it would make the transportation of oxygen a lot more difficult. All right. Um, now, however, there is something that binds, that, that does actually compete with hemoglobin, and that is what we refer to as carbon monoxide, okay? Carbon monoxide, CO. Remember, carbon dioxide is carbon mixed with two oxygens. Carbon monoxide is carbon with one oxygen, okay? Now, typically, so, so basically... The question is so now so now the thing to think about here then with this is that um, is is that carbon monoxide combines with hemoglobin at the same site on that same iron part of the heme group as oxygen. So that means these two fight one another for competition or to 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 compete there. Now this presents a problem. 
This presents a problem because hemoglobin and carbon monoxide interact with one another better than hemoglobin and oxygen. Okay, carbon monoxide essentially, it, when we're talking about the interaction of hemoglobin and carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide has a 250 times greater affinity than oxygen. So basically what I'm saying here is that carbon monoxide is essentially 250 times stickier uh, than, um, than oxygen. So basically what's happening here then is hemoglobin binds to, um, hemoglobin binds to the, 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 or I'm sorry, God, gosh, dang it. Carbon monoxide binds to the heme on the hemoglobin, sorry. And basically as a result, because it, because of this greater affinity, because it's essentially more sticky, um, it's going to stay bound here a lot more tightly. All right, because uh, because one thing you have to think about when when we form oxyhemoglobin, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, that's a very very loose uh, chemical bond there. That's a very loose bond. However, that serves a critical purpose because it's because because the oxygen is so loosely bound to that iron, it's a lot easier to unload it. And when we're trying to deliver oxygen to tissues, that's a nice feature. However, when we when we when we get carbon monoxide in our system. And it and it adheres to uh, hemoglobin a lot more tightly than oxygen. That's a problem because now carbon monoxide is going to occupy the same space that um, that oxygen normally would bind with. So as a result, if our red if our red blood cells get saturated with carbon monoxide, that is that's basically going to prevent oxygen from binding to hemoglobin. And we're essentially really, we're not really going to be able to transport and deliver oxygen to our tissues. All right. Um, and then that essentially is going to cause a person to, um, you know, obviously start to slip out of consciousness. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to cause the brain to shut down. And it's, you know, if you don't catch it quick enough, that's going to be a problem. Uh, now, another thing to think about is that when oxygen, oops, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it causes hemoglobin to turn brighter red, all right? It, 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 it makes it brighter red. That's kind of a sign to think about when you're thinking about carbon monoxide because you're going to see a similar effect. And be, due to that greater affinity, that blood's going to be even brighter red. And areas where you're going to notice this are going to be the lips, the oral, the kind of like the, you know, the, 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 the inside of the mouth, essentially, kind of the oral mucosa, um, you know, the nail beds. They're going to be brighter pink, essentially, or brighter red just due to that, that hemoglobin sticking so tightly, or I'm sorry, a carbon monoxide sticking so tightly to that hemoglobin. All right. So then, so then the, the thing to think about then is, well, how the heck do you deal with this? How do you treat it? And basically, that's where you use... Uh, oxygen, more specifically hyperbaric oxygen. So hyperbaric, hyperbaric O2. So what are we saying there with hyperbaric? Hyper meaning excessive. What does baro mean again? What does baro mean? Baro means pressure. Okay, so normally when we breathe air in, we're breathing air in at about one atmosphere of, um, you know, we're, you know we're, we're breathing oxygen, air in at about one atmosphere. And oxygen, you know, is part of that composition of that one atmosphere of air. When we are, when we're experiencing carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, think, think of this. So, so oxygen has a 1 250th, you know, is less affinity for, for this than for, for the heme and hemoglobin than carbon monoxide. So essentially, that's kind of like saying that, um, that, that basically, you know, we would need 250 oxygen molecules to detach and overcome, you know, to, to, to force that carbon monoxide off. So off the hemoglobin. So what we're going to have to do is add about, uh, add about a pressure of two to three, you know, uh, atmospheres, uh, basically uh, of, of oxygen. So basically what we're saying here is you're, you're, you're pumping highly concentrated oxygen into the, into the person under high pressure and you're forcing a high volume of, of oxygen into the blood to force that carbon monoxide out, which you'll eventually clear out. And, um, and that's essentially how you fix that problem, right? As long as you catch the person while they're still alive, because with carbon monoxide poisoning, 
uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy to go because you, you don't really even know, notice unless it's intentional because, you know, suicide is a very common cause of this. Um, but the question is, what, what, where does carbon monoxide come from? It essentially comes from when you burn things. And like I said, there's, oh, I started this thing. I didn't even finish the story. Sorry. Um, carbon monoxide essentially comes from when you burn things, uh, more specifically organic substances. And when I say burn, I mean literally burn with fire. Um, and that fire is basically eating up the oxygen in the area. So basically, if you are burning something and there's not enough oxygen in the air around that fire, you're going to form carbon monoxide. Um, you know, this is how a lot of people died if their furnaces weren't adjusted properly. Because when you're burning gas in a furnace, all right, there has to be an ad there has to be an adequate amount of air. There has to be a, a, the, the right amount of air entering that furnace. So the carbon that's being emitted from that, you know, propane or whatever kind of gas or fuel it is you're burning. Um, there has to be enough oxygen available f so we can form carbon dioxide, which really isn't going to harm us uh, at all uh, as, as a waste in the air versus carbon monoxide. All right. Um, uh, or, you know, if you're working on a carbureted car in an enclosed area, you know, a car with a carburetor where you adjust the screw in the carburetor and you make the, the, you, basically you make the engine burn the fuel more rich. You're increasing the, the fuel intake and you, you know, you're idling at a higher rate essentially. You're going to emit a lot more carbon monoxide because you're burning a lot more fuel. And then as that exhaust builds up in the in in the uh, you know the garage or the enclosed space, uh, you know you're going to start running out of oxygen and pumping out carbon monoxide, and it's just going to cause you to fall asleep, slip out of consciousness, and pass away. All right, so that essentially is you know hemoglobin and oxygen. All right, and. Uh, I mean, I pretty much explained most of oxygen already. Like I said, I mean, uh, oxygen is primarily bound to hemoglobin. And I've already just, uh, uh, talked about the percent saturation, 98%. All right. And very little of it is freely, in the pla freely found in the plasma. And there are various factors that affect the affinity of oxygen. And basically what I mean is, is how well oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. Um, basically, there are, there are certain internal factors like temperature, pH, uh, your partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and 2,3 BPG that affect us. I'll explain all those individually towards the end of this. Um, but remember, just, just keep in the back of your mind that, that, that when we have oxyhemoglobin, you know, uh, hemoglobin combined with oxygen, oxygen is very loosely attached to hemoglobin. Thus, it's easier for us to get rid of it. But however, if conditions go the opposite, it could also be difficult to get rid of it as well. Now, carbon dioxide transport is a little more of an elaborate process, um, and carbon dioxide transport can affect our ability to circulate oxygen around the body. Um, a little bit of carbon dioxide is essentially dissolved in the plasma, you know, it's freely dissolved in plasma, and we pump it around. Um, about 23% is found in, you know, as compounds, some of it is... Uh, you know, carbon metal hemoglobin bound to carbon dioxide, and but most of it we form, as, or, or I'm sorry, we form, we transport in the form of carbon or carbonic acid and bicarbonate. Okay, and again, it has to do essentially with the behavior of carbon dioxide and how we move it around. So, or and, and especially its solubility in water. So let's kind of talk about that. Let's talk about the carbon the the, the carbon dioxide aspect of this. So let's say we got a red blood cell here, okay? Red blood cells are passing through tissues, and like I said, some of that CO2 is just going to dissolve in the plasma. Some of it's going to connect with bicarbonate ions in the blood, all right? But a lot of it's going to diffuse into the red blood cells. A lot of it, a lot of that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the red blood cells, all right? Um, and like I said, as it, as it comes in, about 20% of it just binds to hemoglobin, right? And remember, it doesn't compete with oxygen. It just it just sits there and forms what's called car um, carbon monohemoglobin. Now, the, the 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 vast majority of carbon dioxide, as it enters the the as it enters red blood cells, and remember, red blood cells are like any other cell. Um, they're full of water. So basically, uh, what can happen as carbon dioxide mixes with the water inside of the red blood cells, what you get when you take CO2, uh, dissolve it 
you know, mix it with water, you form, actually I should do it properly and write this, you form what's called H2CO3. H2CO3. Okay. H2CO3 is what we call carbonic acid. Now, if you've been listening to my lectures from the beginning, I, ke I kept harping on you, on you folks about thinking of carbon dioxide as an acid. Now, like I said before, carbon dioxide itself is not an acid, but how it behaves when we transport it, it behaves as an acid. So basically what's going to happen then is, uh, and remember, this is an arrow here, so this is representing the chemical reaction, carbonic and hydrase. All right, um, so basically these two are going to combine with one another, and what happens is we form carbonic acid. And this is, a, you know, basically this acid, it's, uh, it really quickly then, it's going to disassociate or it's going to get rid of its hydrogen ion, okay? It's going to get rid of its hydrogen ion, and then what happens, what it, uh, when, when H, let's just do this down here, when H2CO3 gets basically disassociates or gets rid of its hydrogen ion, we form, what we have left is we have a hydrogen and we've got bicarbonate. Okay, we've got bicarbonate, all right? So basically we've got, uh, so basically what we're left with is hydrogen ion and, um, and bicarbonate. Now, remember the hemoglobin is a protein, okay? Hemoglobin is a protein, and proteins act as buffers. All right, they're actually interesting buffers because they can they can act uh, to increase and or decrease um, uh, pH. All right, they can they can accept hydrogen ions and also get rid of them. Now, basically, what's going to happen here is uh, most of the but you know, a lot of the bicarbonate that's formed here is going to leave the cell. Okay, it's going to leave the red blood cell and dissolve into the bloodstream, okay? This bicarbonate is going to leave, and then hemoglobin is going to basically buffer that, those, those free hydrogen ions by grabbing onto it, okay? So hydrogen is going to bind to, to the hemoglobin in there. Now, as the red blood cells start to accumulate or build up hydrogen ions, that's going to that's gonna make the inside of this red blood cell a lot more positive, and as a result, that's what that's going to cause chloride to basically um, shift inward um, into the cell. Okay, that's and that's actually what we call the chloride shift. Now that's important because essentially we've got all these positively charged hydrogen ions accumulating as the chloride enters the inside of the cell. That basically creates electron neutrality or balances out the charges inside their red blood cell. All right. Um, and then the opposite is going to happen. Now, this essentially happens in systemic blood, all right? As, as, blood, as, as blood is passing through capillaries, we're grabbing carbon dioxide and we're, we're unloading oxygen and so on. That's essentially, you know, that, that happens here. And this, it's going to happen essentially in reverse once we uh, circulate blood into the lungs because, excuse me, What's going to happen then is, um, you know, we're going to we're going to start unloading and getting rid of carbon dioxide, right? So basically, some of that carbon dioxide is going. So we got so so we got some of that CO2 in the plasma. Some of that CO2 is going to dissolve directly into the alveoli. All right. Um, remember, we have some carbon dioxide that's bound to hemoglobin. All right. It's going to remove itself and dissolve inward. All right, and another thing that's going to happen here is um, is as as red blood cells start to pass through blood and pulmonary capillaries, and what's going to start to happen are, are those hemoglobin molecules are going to start to be they're going to reoxygenate. They're going to start to form into oxyhemoglobin again. Now, one of the reasons why ox, one of the reasons why hydrogen ions stick to hemoglobin. Uh, once we undergo, uh, basically once we form uh, carbonic acid and it gets rid of its hydrogen, is that deoxyhemoglobin has a relatively good affinity for, a relatively high affinity for hydrogen ions. Okay, however, once we recollect oxygen and we start to reform that oxyhemoglobin in pulmonary capillaries, uh, 
that's essentially going to cause hemoglobin to release from, or I'm sorry, hemoglobin, hydrogen ions to release from hemoglobin, okay? And as a result, that's going to start attracting bicarbonate that was in the blood, all right, in, back into red blood cells. And then what will happen are basically that bicarb is going to, uh, uh, oops, is, is going to attach to um, the hydrogen ion, and then we're going to form, uh, you know, car uh, a carbonic acid again. Except, however, this time what's going to happen is the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is going to snap this apart. And what it's going to form, it's going to form carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water. All right. And then that carbon dioxide is then going to diffuse out of the red blood cell and then into the alveolar air sac, and then that's essentially how we transport and get rid of carbon dioxide, all right? So as you can see, it's a little more elaborate of an, uh, an elaborate of a mechanism, but basically all, basically all it's about is um, carbon dioxide in mixing with water, forming carbonic acid. Carbonic acid um, gets rid of, uh, you know, the hydrogen ion, binds to deoxyhemoglobin, and then once we once red blood cells circulate back into pulmonary capillaries and they resaturate with oxygen and form oxyhemoglobin, that's going to cause um, uh, basically an influx of bicarbonate into red blood cells. Now, remember, bicarbonate is negatively charged. Remember, uh, in basically in the in the systemic capillaries and veins and so on, we we created this chloride shift once the once we accumulated all these positively charged hydrogen ions inside red blood cells that caused chloride to shift inward in pulmonary capillaries once all this negatively charged bicarb diffuses into red blood cells that's going to create what's called the reverse chloride shift and cause chloride basically it's going to propel chloride out due to the uh due to the uh, similarity in charges and again, that's just going to uh, uh, create an electrical balance of the of the uh, inside of the red blood cell. Okay, and that's essentially how we transport carbon dioxide around. Like I said, some of it's dissolved in plasma, some of it's bound to hemoglobin, non-competitively with oxygen, and then the rest of it is basically undergoing these you know these reactions, mixing with water, uh, forming carbonic acid, and then vice versa in the lungs. Okay. Um, I know that's kind of a confusing topic, and I know I probably explained it in a little bit of a confusing fashion, but you know, it's one of those, this is always one of those topics that you just kind of have to look at a couple of times, but the more you look at it, the more it's just going to start to sink in and make sense. The last thing I want to talk about here is the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. And again, a mouthful. So basically, what we're what's going on here is um, what we're looking at uh, here is. Uh, uh, we're looking at the, 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 the how saturated oxygen is depending on where we find it in the bloodstream throughout the body, okay? And you'll notice that, um, that, that basically as blood flows throughout the body, so basically this would be like uh, blood flowing throughout muscles and then throughout tissues and then eventually back to the lungs to reconvene or re-grab oxygen and then basically this this curve once blood circulated back out into the systemic circuit would dip back downward again and then kind of s its way back up this is what we refer to as a sigmoid curve now what this essentially what this graph or what this curve is telling you is it's is it's describing factors that um that affect the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin so if um so, for example, uh, some things that we talked about earlier, we said that pH is something that affects uh, the oxygen's affinity to stay stuck to hemoglobin, all right? If our pH goes down and we become more acidic, that creates a decrease in affinity, right? That creates a decrease in affinity. So, as a result, all right, as a result, so basically what, so what you would see here then is if our if our if we become too acidic, that would basically mean oxygen wouldn't stay stuck to hemoglobin as well, and as a result, that would lower the percent saturation of oxygen. Basically, hemoglobin would be less saturated. 
thus causing a shift to the right. So this, this line would essentially shift to the right and dip down. Okay, and obviously the more extreme our pH gets, the more, the further to the right it's going to shift. Now, if we're thinking of like a, like an exercising muscle, like a skeletal muscle, I mean, this is, this, this thing is going to shift way to the right. Okay, because let's think about that for a second. Well, actually, before I talk about that, let's also talk about temperature. All right. Remember, temperature is just a measure of motion, right? Molecular motion. So, so basically we've got this oxygen that's very loosely attached to hemoglobin. All right, and if we increase temperature, that oxygen molecule is going to move around a little more. It's not going to want to stay stuck as well. Plus, that'll also change the shape of the hemoglobin molecule, and make it easier for us to get for us to unload oxygen. All right, so increases in temperature also cause a rightward shift of this curve. Basically, what we're saying here is that as as our body becomes more acidic and its temperature goes up, that is going to decrease the saturation of oxygen in our blood. Now. What's going to happen here then, like I said, think of like, think of a situation like exercise where your skeleton, basically where as you pump blood in your skeletal muscles, well, what's the pH like in your skeletal muscles? The pH is, is very acidic, right? Because you're producing all of these waste products in inside the muscle and dumping them into the bloodstream. So that's going to cause heavy unloading of oxygen. Well, what's the temperature going to be like in muscles? Skeletal muscles that are contracting with the repetitively with a lot of force are generating a lot of heat. And as a result, that's going to cause an increase in temperature in skeletal muscles, which will then cause this, the, 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 basically this curve to shift to the right and cause a greater unloading of oxygen. However, that's a good thing because as we're pumping blood through harder working skeletal muscles, there's a greater demand for oxygen and that, that, more hazardous environment causes a greater unloading. That means more oxygen is delivered to, to skeletal muscle cells. Plus, skeletal muscle cells have a specialized pigment on their surface called myoglobin that's very similar to hemoglobin that grabs onto oxygen and basically makes, uh, makes it easier for muscles to absorb oxygen. So those are factors that cause a rightward shift in this. So then, obviously, the, the opposite of this then would be if we have an increase in pH and a decrease in temperature, that would increase hemoglobin's affinity to oxygen, and that would increase our uh, basically that would increase our O2 saturation as blood flow throughout the body. However, that's not necessarily a good thing because that means we are not unloading oxygen like we should. We're not delivering enough oxygen to our tissues. And that also means we're not going to really be able to, you know, obviously if we're not unloading oxygen, we're not going to reload with a lot as well. All right, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. And carbon dioxide, remember, carbon dioxide essentially behaves as an acid. So as a result, okay, as a result, that's going to essentially cause, as we accumulate CO2, that's going to essentially cause a rightward shift in this curve as well. And not enough CO2 will cause a leftward shift. All right. Um, last thing I want to talk about was, um, uh, the other thing I want to talk about here was, uh, um, two, three DPG. Okay. Essentially it's a byproduct of the anaerobic metabolism of red blood cells. And it really does one thing. It basically causes, he it lowers hemoglobin's affinity for, um, Oxygen, so basically it forces unloading um, of oxygen. Now, typically, when when red blood cells are saturated with oxygen, um, that kind of inhibits this chemical. However, in situations like high, severe hypoxia or where a person's not breathing, all right, that's going to increase the activity of this chemical, and that is going to cause the release. Basically, that's going to cause hemoglobin to release more oxygen. Now, think of that in a situation like anemia, where a person it just has a harder time, uh, meta you know, basically managing oxygen in the first place. All right, that's gonna that's gonna cause that that little bit of oxygen or that reserve to be unloaded more. Or if a person is completely unconscious, all right, this essentially will bias a couple of minutes of delivery of oxygen to our tissues because. Uh, because basically, remember, we've always got that oxygen reserve in our blood, right? Remember, we only unload about 22% of oxygen off of hemoglobin. So basically, this chemical will cause us to tap into this oxygen reserve and help us preserve our organs for a couple of minutes, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, if we are unconscious and not breathing. That's why you don't see brain damage or organ damage kick in right away when we're unconscious because this essentially helps us, you know, unload more in a situation like that. All right. All right. Well, I hope I didn't confuse you all too much with this. I know this is always a confusing topic, especially when thinking about carbon dioxide, but that essentially is the process of um, gas transport.